My name is Kelly Dieck, and it is my pleasure to be able to, again, be able to present to you this afternoon to give you a little bit of background uh, about myself for those who have not heard me speak before. I have spent my entire career in the laboratory, having been in the field for almost 30 years. Um, I am a cytotechnologist by background with my specialty, having then later in my career earning my certification in histology. For the last almost 20 years, I have had the responsibility for the anatomic pathology departments for our healthcare system, as well as all things quality and regulatory related. As is the case in most laboratories, safety has always been an integral component of our quality management system. I have spent a great deal of time working with our leadership teams to emphasize both the importance of education and significance of employee accountability in this area. This presentation, as Josh, men Josh mentioned, is part two of a two-part series on laboratory safety. In this second part, we're going to focus on bloodborne pathogen safety and, hit, and then hit on several general lab safety topics. So with that in mind, the agenda for the presentation this afternoon will include the following items in relation to bloodborne pathogen safety, infection control, and general lab safety. We will first talk about universal precautions and what that means, along with the purpose of the exposure control plan and safety policies. We will discuss, discuss exposures and risks found in the laboratory and infection controls that are in place to protect against them. Biohazard waste and Sharps disposal will be our next topic of discussion. And then our discussion will then take a turn towards several general safety topics, the balance, if you will, from part one, if you were able to join us for that session. And then finally, we will touch upon some risk mitigation processes and tools. So what does it mean when we say that we follow universal precautions? This is an important concept that anyone in the laboratory should fully understand. The term universal precautions refers to a concept of bloodborne disease control requiring all human blood and other potentially infectious materials to be treated as if infectious for HIV, hepatitis B or C, or other bloodborne pathogens, regardless of the perceived low risk status of a patient or patient population. You may also hear the terms body substance isolation or standard precautions. These terms define all body fluids and substances as infectious. And this makes sense, right? In our world of safety, you never really know the infectious status of a patient. So when you treat every, every patient as infectious, you have reduced your risk of exposure by handling every specimen with the appropriate protective equipment and or engineering controls. Universal precautions, body substance isolation, and standard precautions refer to a lot of terms within their definitions that we need to define so we are consistent in what we apply these processes to. Generically, the concept refers to blood, bloodborne pathogens, infectious materials, and body fluids, just to name a few. These are all buckets of specimen types that include a variety of things. Blood means human blood, human blood components, and products made from human blood. Bloodborne pathogens is defined as pathogenic microorganisms that are present in human blood and can cause disease in humans. These pathogens include, but are not limited to, hepatitis B virus or HBV, hepatitis C virus or HCV, and human immunodeficiency virus, also referred to as HIV. Infectious material refers to many substances, including semen, vaginal secretions, CSF, synovial fluid, pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal fluid, amniotic fluid, any body fluid that is visibly contaminated with blood, and all body fluids in situations where it's difficult or impossible to differentiate between body fluids. It also refers to any unfixed tissue or organ from a human that is either living or dead. There is a wide breadth of specimen types to which universal precautions and the related concepts apply. Based on this list we just reviewed, it is essentially every patient specimen we deal with in the laboratory. The exposure control plan, similar to the chemical hygiene plan, is a document or set of documents that outlines how we keep our employees safe from all of the biological agents they could be exposed to in the handling of blood, body fluids, and tissue every single day. 
Within the exposure control plan, we must identify, according to job classification or job description, whether and how bloodborne pathogen exposure occurs. Additionally, the exposure control plan is meant to specifically lay out all the components of the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standards and how they are carried out by the laboratory. In addition to the exposure control plan, you should also have general safety policies in place to support every part of your safety program. Towards the latter part of the presentation, we will talk about some general safety topics. It will be those topics that need to have policies to support how you keep your staff safe and what your expectations are for them. So jobs are sort of ranked or tasks are ranked, if you will, depending on what level of exposure is foreseen in that particular job or collaboration of, of tasks that are associated with that job. Every job code or description should be given a category assignment as to what the risk is based on defined categories. The lower the category, the more risk the employee has during their regular duties each day of work. So there are three categories in which exposure is classified. The first category is category one and indicates that the employee will have regular exposure to bloodborne pathogens. PPE will be required, including lab coats, gloves, face shields, masks, and or eye protection when performing. Examples of tasks where category one exposure is expected include but are not limited to handling potentially infectious body fluids, tissue, and organs in the course of processing and testing specimens, performing phlebotomy, transporting specimens, and disposing of specimens. Category two indicates that there is some exposure, but not all the time. So protective equipment is required when performing category one tasks or when situations necessitate protection. And then finally, the lowest category is category three, where there is no exposure risk. Protective equipment is not required for tasks that are category three. So understanding how you can be infected within the laboratory lends to understanding how infection controls can be effective to ensure your safety. Infections may be spread by four main routes. The actual occurrence, of course, of an infection depends on both the virulence of the infecting agent and the susceptibility of the host. The first route is airborne, where droplets and aerosols may be formed by simply removing caps or cotton plugs or swabs from tubes. Breakage and centrifuges can also cause serious concern for airborne infection. Ingestion may occur through mouth pipetting, failure to wash hands after handling specimens or cultures, and by handling of cigarettes. The third route is direct inoculation, which is caused by scratches, needles, or broken glass. And then the final route is through skin, skin contact, where organisms can enter through small cuts or scratches or through the conjunctiva of the eye. So let's talk a little more specifically about some of the more concerning agents in the laboratory that your safety policies are set out to protect you from. TB or tuberculosis is an agent that is carried through the air. For people that have TB, it can be spread by droplets. So for example, when an infected person coughs, sneezes, laughs, sings, or speaks, and then signs and symptoms of this infection include weight loss, night sweats, fatigue, fever, productive cough, blood in the sputum, and loss of appetite. Generally, a definitive diagnosis of TB is done with acid fast culture. Exposure to TB in the laboratory can be from respiratory specimens such as BALs, bronchial washings and brushings, and sputum. HIV is a viral infection of the immune system. Body fluids that transmit the virus include vaginal secretions and semen, synovial, pleural, pericardial, and cerebral spinal, and then amniotic fluids, breast milk, and any unfixed human tissue. Patients that have been diagnosed with HIV have two diagnoses depending on the extent of the HIV. HIV positive means that the virus has been contracted, but no signs or symptoms are present. And then AIDS, or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, is when a patient is HIV positive and has signs and symptoms of the disease. Exposure to HIV in the laboratory can again occur at any point during the processing and handling of specimens coming through the laboratory. The last topic of agents we are going to discuss is hepatitis. 
Hepatitis B and C are both viral infections of the liver, with hepatitis C being the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the United States. Again, exposure to hepatitis in the laboratory can occur during processing and specimen handling tasks. So while most of the clinical departments receive mainly blood and some body fluid specimens, anatomic pathology and microbiology receive a whole other array of specimens. Microbiology sees blood and many body fluid specimens along with tissue samples, and anatomic pathology sees mostly body fluid and tissue samples. Microbiology by nature of this science often is dealing with agents that are unknown and could be agents of bioterrorism. Anatomic pathology deals with fresh tissue, so some agents that might not be concerns in other departments are more of a concern for the histotechnologists and cytology prep personnel. This includes both Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, and tuberculosis. Much of the time, tissue is sent to the laboratory in fixative, However, frozen sections and autopsies introduce exposure to tissue in its fresh state, and therefore risk is higher for exposure when performing these procedures. We discussed TB earlier. However, I also wanted to mention CJD for more awareness because the safety precautions employees should take associated with this agent are extensive. They are beyond the scope of this presentation, so I will not be going into any detail on CJD, but you should familiarize yourself with these policies and procedures in your laboratory. So after going through many of the types of exposure risks that exist in the laboratory, as well as the degree of risk and routes of infection, it is comforting to know that we can minimize these risks with a number of different infection controls. There are many processes that we follow in the lab in order to control exposure. We are going to review several of them. These are only as good as everyone's compliance to the activity, however, so it is important that staff follow the processes that are set out for them to reduce their risk of exposure. Specimen handling is the first major topic. It is the first point of exposure once a specimen has been collected from a patient. Specimens should always be submitted in an appropriately labeled and well-constructed container with a lid that is secure in order to prevent leakage during transport. Specimen containers should not have gross external contamination. If it is absolutely unavoidable, the specimen container should be placed in a secondary plastic bag to protect subsequent handlers. Personal protective equipment must always be worn when handling specimens. This is a frequent compliance issue observed in many laboratories. Staff, staff often handle specimens with no gloves or other PPE because they cannot see any visible contamination. And this is a big no-no. We will discuss surface decontamination again later, but all work surfaces used for specimen handling must be disinfected after contamination and at the end of the work shift. This activity must be documented within the quality control program. Specimen processing is sort of the next step after a specimen is handled, if you will. Specimen processing covers those actions taken to get the specimen ready for the analytic part of the process. All procedures involving blood or other potentially infectious materials must be performed in such a manner as to minimize splashing, spraying, splattering, and the generation of droplets of these substances. General guidelines that should be used during specimen processing include centrifuging specimens with caps secured on tubes. Centrifuges should not be operated unless the covers are closed and firmly latched. When stoppers must be remo removed from the vacutainer tubes, they should be done so carefully. In order to avoid splashing, cover the stopper first with gauze or absorbent material and then remove the stopper. Class one or two biological safety cabinets should be used whenever procedures are conducted that have a high potential for generating droplets. These activities uh, include things such as blending, sonicating, and vigorous mixing. Goggles, face shields, and stationary splash shields must be available for use and be used when performing activities that carry a risk of splashing. Specimens are transported in a variety of ways as related to the laboratory. They can be transported from departments of a hospital to the lab. They can come from the outside from other labs or physician offices. They can be sent out from the lab to reference labs, 
or they can be transported from one department of the lab to the other. In order to minimize potential exposures during transport, specimens must be properly packaged and labeled to indicate the general nature of the materials transported. Remember, during transport, specimens are usually outside of the laboratory walls and therefore potential for exposure to innocent bystanders. Additionally, when specimens are transported by couriers in vehicles, there is even greater risk of exposure in the event of an accident. When specimens are transported to other facilities, they must be packaged for shipment in accordance with applicable national, federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Additionally, the personnel that perform these tasks, whether it is the packaging of the specimens for shipment or the transporting of these specimens, must be trained in appropriate safety and packaging procedures suitable to specimen type and distances transported. For the most part, incidents during shipment are rare. However, we need to make sure that we keep our couriers safe. This is where the packaging compliance plays a large role, and we need to make sure in the event something does happen, our couriers are educated on what to do in order to minimize both their exposure and anyone around them. Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE, in appropriate sizes must be readily available to all employees who need it to perform their jobs. This includes gloves, fluid-resistant lab coats, aprons, face shields or masks, and eye protection. PPE that is provided should be maintained in a sanitary and reliable condition in all technical work areas in which blood and body substances are handled and in circumstances during which exposure is likely to occur. PPE that employees must don must be assigned based on a task assessment that should be conducted. The goal of the PPE is to deter blood or other potentially infectious materials to pass through or reach an individual's work clothes, skin, eyes, mouth, or other mucous membranes under normal conditions of use. Prior to leaving the work area, all PPE must be removed and placed in the appropriate designated area. Generally speaking, PPE not wringing wet with blood may be disposed of in regular trash. As part of the protection for exposure, while not PPE directly, if employees have any skin defects, such as exudate lesions, dermatitis, cuts, or abrasions, they should cover them with a water impermeable occlusive bandage. This includes defects on the arms, face, and neck, essentially any areas that have a high risk of exposure. While everyone is very familiar with PPE, I'm going to just go over some basic guidelines for the more frequently worn items. Pretty much every employee in the lab wears gloves, and not just one pair, but many, many pairs. Employees should wear disposable single-use gloves when they have the potential for direct skin contact with blood and infectious materials, mucous membranes, and non-intact skin. Gloves must be worn when performing any patient collections and handling any specimens, including containers, bags, the specimens themselves, and any time contaminated items are handled. During patient collections, gloves must be changed between patients and are to be removed immediately upon completion of the specimen collection. Disposable gloves must be removed inside out aseptically and replaced as soon as possible when visibly soiled, torn, punctured, or any time their ability to function as a barrier is compromised. They must not be washed and disinfectant for use. Gloves, gloves must fit properly. They should neither be too large, where there are gaps and are difficulty keeping the glove on the hand, nor should they be too light, where they are uncomfortable to wear, I'm sorry, too tight, where they are uncomfortable to wear. Additionally, gloves that are too tight have a higher risk of ripping because that material is just pulled too taut. Hands must be washed immediately or as soon as possible after gloves are removed. Disinfectant hand cleaner may be utilized as needed between patients. However, hands must be washed with soap and water as soon as possible. Gloves that have been contaminated with blood should generally be discarded in the appropriate biohazard container. Gloves not contaminated with blood can generally be disposed of in regular trash. Gloves should be removed when using equipment that is designated as clean 
as well as when departing the laboratory. It is okay to wear gloves to use items that are deemed dirty um, in certain areas. Laboratory coats are another more common type of PPE found in the laboratory and worn by most staff. Laboratory coats should really fit properly, not being too big or too small. They should be buttoned uh, and they cannot be contaminated with blood or body fluids. Aprons should be worn in addition to the laboratory coat when the laboratory coat cannot provide adequate protection or when fluid contamination is likely. Aprons should not be substitutes for laboratory coats, but serve as additional protection, particularly when exposure to large volumes of body fluids is anticipated. Laboratory coats, coats that are worn in the work area are not to be worn during meals or breaks in any public area, for example, in the cafeteria, in your lobbies, gift shops, et cetera. Clean laboratory, laboratory coats that are designated as clean should be worn for this purpose. If grossly contaminated, the lab coat must be replaced with a clean one. Masks, of which we are very used to most recently, and eye protection devices are commonly worn in the laboratory. Laboratory employees should wear masks in combination with eye protection devices whenever splashes, sprays, splatter, or droplets of blood or other potentially infectious materials may be generated and eye, nose, or mouth contamination can be reasonably anticipated. If an employee is doing work where there is potential for splash, the employee must work behind a protective shield or wear a full face shield. While gloves must be worn to protect our hands from biologic exposure, we cannot assume that the gloves have kept our hands 100% free of infectious agents. Additionally, washing our hands effectively is the number one way to reduce infections. Again, another topic that we hear lots about nowadays with the pandemic. Laboratory staff should regularly wash their hands as soon as feasible after every patient contact, removal of gloves, and before leaving the laboratory. If there was contact with blood or other potentially infectious material, the area should be washed with soap and water or mucous membranes should be flushed with water immediately or as soon as feasible. Facilities for hand washing should be clean and not used for washing equipment or for waste disposal. It is acceptable practice to use an antibacterial no-rinse skin cleanser for use when hand washing facilities are not accessible. So to quickly review the correct process for washing your hands, I know probably many of us hear this over and over and over again at our facilities, but sometimes it helps with the, the repetition to, to kind of you know, get into that good habit of washing your hands appropriately. So your first step is wetting the hands first with warm water and applying about a quarter size amount of soap. Rubbing your hands vigorously for about 20 seconds, Lots of people say singing the happy birthday song while you're doing that is about 20 seconds long, covering all surfaces of the hands and fingers front and back. The next step is rinsing your hands with water, trying to avoid using hot water and drying your hands then completely with a disposable towel. That towel then that you use to dry your hands should be used to turn off the faucet and then dispose of the towel and, and then dispose of that towel in the garbage. So all equipment and working surfaces must be regularly cleaned and decontaminated after contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials. Additionally, work surfaces should be decontaminated after the completion of procedures and at the end of each shift. The process for decontamination must be followed to ensure that the effectiveness of the reagent can take effect. There is a wet time defined for various products, and it is critical that these wet times be followed in order to ensure that the surface you just cleaned is in fact decontaminated. Documentation of the performance of this task must be completed within the quality control program. Surface decontamination is a very important infection control because you are many times cleaning up the, the unknown or the invisible, a lot of people say. There are certain activities that are absolutely not allowed in the laboratory due to the high risk of exposure that they carry. And I've listed some of them on this slide. Smoking, vaping, eating, gum chewing, drinking, um, application of any cosmetics or lip balm, um, taking your contact lenses in or out or adjusting them, 
and of course any mouth pipetting in, in any of the technical work areas. Um, as far as pipetting is concerned, pipetting aids should be made available for every task and staff should absolutely use them. Um, and one of these things includes the mechanical pipetting devices and bulbs that, that should be used as a, as a replacement for um, doing any sort of mouth pipetting. So biohazard spills, which are those that include body or blood, uh, body fluids or blood, are going to happen. So when they do, they must be cleaned up with the area decontaminated as soon as possible. These spills should be considered infectious until decontamination is complete. It is recommended that this type of spill be cleaned with a concentrated germicide or a one to 10 solution of bleach. The germicide or the bleach solution should be poured around the spill and an, absor and an absorbent material um, such as paper towels should be layered over it. You allow that contact time, the appropriate contact time um, to ensure that adequate germicidal action has taken place. And again, this varies depending on the reagent being used. And then that absorbent material should then be placed in a biohazard waste bag and disposed of in accordance with the facility policy. So moving on to talk, to talk a little bit about visitors in the laboratory. All visitors to the laboratory have the potential to being exposed to bloodborne pathogens. It is a challenge to ensure that laboratorians are compliant and safe as they handle their day-to-day -day tasks. It is even more important to ensure any visitor in the laboratory is aware of the surroundings that they are entering and the risk that is present. Visitors are not always educated on the potential exposure risks. So as visitors enter the laboratory, they must be kept informed and given direction to ensure their safety. Visitors coming directly into the laboratory departments must be instructed as to what is clean and what is dirty. They should be advised not to touch anything that is defined as clean, assuming they are, you know, have gloves on or, or what have you. And then PPE should be donned when there is potential that contact with dirty surfaces is possible. So this is most certainly the case for any field reps that are coming in to work on equipment. Generally, if visitors are visiting office areas only, PPE is not necessary as these are considered clean areas. So due to the exposure risk healthcare workers experience in their everyday tasks, healthcare facilities are required to offer hepatitis B vaccines to its employees free of charge. This includes three injections over a six month period of time with a blood test utilized to check for protection after the series is given. At this time, hepatitis C vaccines are not yet available. Incidents involving in a, a laboratory employee's exposure to a bloodborne pathogen must be reported and documented. Depending on the setup of your lab and whether it resides in a bigger facility, this reporting might be expected in tiers, meaning, you will be expected to report to your immediate leadership team, but then it may, might also be expected to be reported to a higher level safety committee, infection control department, employee health, or quality department. Employee exposure should be taken very seriously with policies and procedures being available to address steps to be taken after possible and known percutaneous mucous membrane or braided skin exposure to HIV, HBV, or HCV. Generally, they include the following elements. Sometimes you'll see the, the, there will be testing of the source patient, assuming um, consent can be obtained from that patient for HIV, HPV, and HCV. And of course, this, this is always a, a, a good step because if you can test the source patient, then you know whether you've been exposed or not. The healthcare wor worker themselves might also be evaluated both clinically and serologically. And then finally, consideration of a pro appropriate prophylaxis based on medical indications, the serological status, and the informed consent of the healthcare worker. The following action should be taken when there is an employee exposure in order to attempt to minimize the long-term effects of that exposure. When employees have parenteral exposures, which are the result of needle sticks or punctures by a sharp, they should squeeze blood from the wound and then use an abrasive method to scrub the area with soap and water. If an employee is exposed through a mucous membrane, such as the eyes or mouth, like they were splashed, they should flush that area with, a, with water for about 15 minutes. 
cutaneous exposures, which are exposures on non-intact skin or skin that is affected with dermatitis, should be flushed with water for 15 minutes using abrasive methods to scrub the area with soap and water. Again, I cannot repeat this enough. All exposure incidents must be reported to laboratory leadership with any kind of required incident report being completed as soon as possible. There's a very specific way that biohazard waste material must, must be disposed. These sorts of materials cannot just be disposed of in regular trash. They must be disposed of in such a way that those, are, that, those that are subsequently handling the laboratory garbage are prepared and educated as to how to handle this type of waste. The goal is to ensure that others are not exposed to bloodborne pathogens because they are not prepared to do so. This might vary from lab to lab depending on local and state regulations. So we are going to review the most basic concepts of biohazard waste that applies to all. In order to appropriately dispose of waste in the laboratory, employees must understand what is considered biohazard waste and what is not. Additionally, it must be clear what is considered appropriate for the disposal of biohazard waste. Obviously, all patient specimens will be considered potential biohazard material and should be placed in biohazard containers after use. An exception to this might be 24-hour urines, depending on your local and facility policy. This type of specimen can often be disposed of directly through the sanitary sewer system, provided it is flushed through with a sufficient volume of water. In these cases, urine containers may be discarded in regular trash. Biohazard containers should be lined with biohazard bags and covered at all times if they are not hard-sided. Hard-sided containers do not necessarily need to be double-lined with biohazard bags, they can be used as they are, but they must be kept covered at all times. Biohazard bags should be discarded in a designated area for laboratory biohazard waste and should be restricted to laboratory personnel only. So this means that these areas should not be in areas that are accessible to the public. They should only be accessible to staff who have been educated on how to appropriately handle biohazard waste. At our facility, paraffin blocks from the anatomic pathology department have been determined to be biohazard waste, and we do dispose of these as such into our biohazard garbage. Biohazard waste is considered a kind of regulated waste, if you will, because it cannot be just disposed in regular garbage. Regulated waste disposable, disposal must comply with rules and regulations for exactly how it is to be disposed so as to protect those that are transporting it. Regulated waste should always be placed in containers that are able to be closed, constructed to contain all contents and prevent leakage of fluids during handling, storage, transport, or shipping, labeled or color-coded as determined by the facility, and then these containers must be closed prior to removal to prevent spillage or protrusion of contents during handling, storage, transport, or shipping. The actual disposal of regulated waste must be in accordance with applicable local, state, and federal regulations. Generally, the hauling of this kind of waste is contracted by laboratories with companies that specialize in the transporting and ultimate disposal of this kind of waste. It is important to discern between what needs to go into the regulated waste bucket and what can go into regular trash. Reason being, it costs a lot more to handle regulated waste than it does the regular trash, and most times this cost is determined by weight. So you want to only put what needs to go in the regulated biohazard trash, what absolutely needs to be disposed of in this manner. Items such as paper goods and PPE that is not obviously soiled with blood or other potentially infectious materials can go into regular garbage. Make sure that you are keeping an eye on this at your facilities. This is an easy way to find cost-saving measures if you can reduce the number of pounds of regulated waste that your facilities are produ producing simply because items that are not considered biohazard are being placed into your biohazard garbage. We discovered a number of years ago that this was a shortcoming for our facilities, and we were able to decrease our waste significantly by simply making sure that garbage was going into the right bins. Contaminated sharps means any contaminated object that can penetrate the skin, including but not limited to needles, scalpels, broken or chipped glass, slides, and broken capillary tubes. 
Needle sticks are so common among healthcare workers and are an exposure that should be tightly trended at all facilities because they are so avoidable. Needles used during patient collections are not the only needles that employees are at risk for exposure, specifically through a needle stick. Needles should not be used in the laboratory during specimen processing unless absolutely no alternative exists, as this can also introduce the opportunity for a needle stick. Regardless of how the needle is used, it must be discarded in puncture-resistant sharps containers. Vacutainer needles should have the safety sheath activated per manufacturer specification. Specific actions can be taken to avoid needle sticks from happening due to carelessness or avoidable accidents. Contaminated sharps should not be purposely bent or broken, removed from disposable syringes, manually manipulated or recapped, and they must be disposed of in appropriate containers immediately or as soon as possible after use. Sharps, including those needles, vacutainer tubes, slides, and butterfly devices, must be disposed in what we call a sharps container, and this is a container that is closable, puncture resistant, and leak proof on the sides and bottoms. It must be labeled as biohazard sharps and is easily accessible, meaning it is located in areas where needles are commonly used. Items not considered a sharp should not be placed into a sharps container. These items, depending on whether they are biohazard garbage, should either go into regular waste or into the biohazard waste. Sharps containers must not be overfilled, and they, they generally have a line on the side of them that indicates the top level that waste should reach. We never want anyone trying to push down waste to fit more in, and we don't want items sticking out of the top. So these fill lines must be strictly adhered to. Employees should never reach into any sharps container by hand where sharps have been placed. Proper technique should be used if a needle must be removed from a syringe prior to disposing of the syringe in the appropriate biohazard container. If possible, disposal of the syringe with the intact needle should be the, should be the process that you follow. Vacutainer needles should have the safety sheath device activated per manufacturer and Per, per manufacturer specification with the entire vacutainer apparatus disposed of in a biohazard container. When the sharps container contents has reached the fill line, close the container and ensure the container is labeled with needle hazard and biohazard signs. It can then be placed in the designated location in your laboratory. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a smattering of general safety topics we are going to go through. And this is kind of the balance of the, of the general lab safety topics that I spoke about in uh, part one of this series. So there is a ton of information on this slide and I, I apologize for that. Um, but there are many precautions that must be taken into consideration when it comes to compressed gases. Safety procedures must be employed, which will protect employees from both the types of hazards associated with the compressed gas cylinders, which include the hazards of the actual contents and then the hazard of that cylinder becoming a projectile. Cylinders must only be used by trained personnel and those cylinders containing toxic gases should be used in a hood. Gas cylinders must be positioned well away from an open flame or other heat sources such as, uh, such as flammable gas cylinders being stored in a separate ventilated room or enclosure closure, which has been reserved exclusively for that purpose and which has a fire resistance classification of at least two hours. All compressed gas cylinders must be chained to the wall or otherwise held in place to prevent damage to the neck, pressure reducing valve or regulator and there should be no more than one extra cylinder of compressed flammable gas other than those actually connected for use at any one working station. As an exception, small cylinders may aggregate to a two-day working supply at the workstation. Cylinders should not be stored on their side, nor should they be accepted with physical distortions. Cylinders for blood gas analyzers will be stored as per manufacturer's instructions. These cylinders are an exception to this rule as they can be stored upright or lying down. When not in use, cylinders must be stored with valve safety caps in place, and when opening container valves, it should be done slowly, pointing away from all personnel. All of the labels on the cylinders should be read before use, with cylinders being marked clearly with the name of the contents. You should not rely solely on the color coding of the cylinders for identifying the contents. 
Tags and descriptive labels must be attached for verification. Otherwise, don't use the cylinder. Return the cylinder to the vendor as being unidentifiable. Valve safety covers should be left on until pressure regulators are attached. And the proper regulator must be used for each type of gas tank using only the manufacturer's recommended regulator and valves. Hand trucks or dollies must be used when cylinders are being transported. Cylinders should not be rolled, dragged, tipped over, or dropped during the moving process. And they should never be allowed to strike each other with force. Oil, grease, or lubricants on the valves, regulators, or fittings should never be used. And do not attempt to repair damaged cylinders or to force open frozen cylinder valves. Do not apply force to open a stuck cylinder valve or tamper with the fittings, valves, or regulators. In case of exposure or expected exposure to corrosive, toxic, or poisonous gases, employees should get medical attention immediately. And then once empty, cylinders should be marked empty with the valve safety caps replaced. They should be removed promptly from the workspace. In the anatomic pathology department, there is potential to receive radioactive specimens. Sentinel lymph node biopsy is an emerging treatment option for patients with early stage invasive breast cancers and a clinical negative egg cilla. This procedure is performed in order to determine if a patient has metastasis. TC99 sulfur colloid is the agent typically used in sentinel lymphadenectomy. While it's necessary to have policies and procedures in place for the handling of these kinds of specimens, it is often determined that the amount of exposure of our staff is low enough where there is no concern for employee safety. However, it is important that facilities complete their due diligence and work with their radiation oncology teams in order to make this determination. As part of the laboratory safety program, every staff member must be able to give input as to their ergonomic satisfaction and comfort while doing their job. Tedious, repetitive work is a key part of the laboratorian's daily responsibilities. This type of work can cause both mental and physical stress, as well as increased error rates and phys physical fatigue due to its repetitive nature. Fortunately, the science of ergonomics has come up with solutions to keep many potential stress-related physical problems from occurring. According to OSHA, there are several, several common multiskeletal, musculoskeletal disorders that could result due to repetitive tasks, and I have included those on, the, on this slide. The main ergonomic risk factors that we want to combat are force, posture, repetition, contact stress, vibration, and environmental factors. Products must be selected that are de designed to minimize the magnitude of any one of these risk factors. In addition, the lab and its workspaces must be designed in such a way that there is an adequate amount of space for instrumentation, all the accompanying equipment and tasks that must be carried out. An organized work area assists laboratorians in minimizing awkward body positions. So because every employee is different, it is important for employees to communicate to the leadership teams what they need in order to do their job comfortably. This includes things like anti-fatigue mats, wrist rests, chairs with foot rests, sufficient chairs and back support for those who might spend a great deal of time sitting, and monitor risers. The items needed often vary among employees, so individual input is important. It is our responsibility as employers to ensure that employees have these tools to do their jobs comfortably. Walk into any lab and you will hear noise. Noise comes from all kinds of things found in the laboratory environment. Alarms, conversation noise, exhaust, fans, overhead speakers, et cetera, et cetera. One of the biggest noise makers in any labs is the equipment itself. And noise must be assessed in order to ensure that there is not too much noise in any one given space. An eight hour time weighted average or a TWA of 84 decibels or lower is considered accept acceptable exposure for noise. And of course, 85 and higher is considered unacceptable. An initial assessment must always be completed in various locations throughout the laboratory to assess if there are areas where that 85 decibel lim level limit is being met or exceeded. If at the time of initial assessment, all areas are within compliance, monitoring can just be then repeated whenever there is a 
change in production, process, equipment, or controls, which may increase or change that noise exposure. It is a requirement that we must have a, a, a continuing effective hearing conservation program should be administered whenever employee exposures equal or exceed an eight hour time weighted average of 85 decibels. Feasible administrative or engineering controls are to be utilized when employees are subjected to sound exceeding this limit. And then if such controls fail to reduce the sound levels, personal protective equipment must be provided. Liquid nitrogen is sometimes used in the anatomic pathology departments um, during frozen section procedures. Um, I don't see this as much as I used to anymore. Um, and then dry ice is often used for shipping in all areas of the laboratory to keep various things um, cold. I think we're all guilty of being sort of mesmerized by the effects of dry ice, um, but both of these substances should really be used with caution. Insulated gloves, dry ice tongs or scoops, and safety goggles or glasses should be used when handling either liquid nitrogen or dry ice. Both substances should only be used in well-ventilated areas. Employees should be familiar with and know how to find the safety data sheets associated with these substances and be trained on their safe handling. Another safety area that does not affect everyone but worth mentioning is exposure, exposure to ultraviolet light. UV light may cause corneal or skin burns from direct or deflected light sources. And appropriate personnel protective equipment must be worn when there are UV light sources being emitted from equipment that staff must use. Instruments should be evaluated for such emittance and, communicated, and communications should be um, given to the staff so that they are aware of whether they're having this exposure or not. Additionally, signs should be posted alerting staff to the safety hazard. The last general safety topic I'm going to talk about is uh, latex allergy. Uh, an allergy to latex is very common. This is a concern not only for the staff, but also for patients during procedures. A number of years ago, there was a mandate to move to latex-free environments. And at that time, initiatives were in place that replaced most products that had latex and removed most activities within facilities that would facilitate latex exposure. Since then, education and training programs continue to assist in assuring that our staff and patients with latex allergies are safe from having reactions. So the last element I'm going to talk, last uh, section I guess I'm going to talk about here is um, risk mitigation and uh, communication to our, our staff. So risk mitigation is very relative when it comes to laboratory safety. While we have policies and procedures in place for reference, it is important to trust but verify. And we're going to review some of those methods to monitor the behavior of staff and the environment in which they work to ensure their safety. So um, because we're, I'm getting a little short on time here, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the next um, four slides. But the next four slides contain screenshots from a monitoring form that we use on a quarterly basis in all the departments of the laboratory. Um, and basically, we assign various people throughout the lab to monitor the various activities as listed on the form. There's the first three uh, pages of the form. And then the last page of the form kind of shows our administrative and then our medical director sign off. Um, and then ultimately, that gets sent to our safety officer for the system, who then reviews it and addresses any items where corrective action or follow up is necessary. And then the next two slides, um, and again, I just took some snippets from the actual tool. This is our annual safety review tool. It's something we do every year. Um, and again, it sort of focuses on key areas of safety, um, high risk, problem prone areas that we know we need to look at and make sure that staff are acting accordingly. Um, the first one has to do with personal protective equipment that I have shown here. And then the second little snippet is specifically on bloodborne pathogens. And again, this is sort of randomly assigned um, to various people so that we can get a good unbiased assessment of our, our staff behavior. So the last thing I'm just gonna touch upon real quick here is just communication. Um, again, it is really important that even though we do all these things and we, we say we do all these things, it's really important to communicate to the staff when it comes to lab safety. Um, and then, and then in addition to communicating with them about what's going on, to also educate and then train them 
um, based on a lot of those um, uh, assessments that you do and the monitoring that you do and the feedback that you get. Um, a lot of times the behaviors that we're trying to um, either eliminate or uh, support um, come from employees just understanding what it is they're being exposed to, what sort of infection controls they have at their fingertips, and really understanding you know, what that risk is for them. So with that, I will conclude by re-emphasizing the importance of having a solid safety program in place for the laboratory. Additionally, the responsibility for labor laboratory safety lies with the leadership team to establish and monitor, but also with us as laboratorians to hold ourselves and fellow coworkers accountable in our daily work activities. We are exposed daily to many hazards to our health and safety. This pre presentation focused primarily on biological safety, but as we discussed last month, there's also chemical safety standards that we need to acknowledge. It takes everyone doing their part to keep the risks we are exposed to daily to a minimum, knowing that we already accepted a certain amount of risk when we entered the field. So I hope you found this presentation uh, worthwhile and valuable. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address indicated in this last slide.